Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that holiness, righteousness. Father, we thank you that peace and love, Father, dwell in this house. Father, not because we do, but because you do. Father, the scripture tells us that for him to increase, we must decrease. So, Lord, today, Father, we decrease. And, Father, we know that, Father, there's a time and a change. There's a different season coming. Lord, we know that winter is right around the corner. Lord, we know there's a change in the season of weather. There's a change in the season in the political. There's a change in the season in the spiritual. Lord, there's a change... Father, going on, that Father, sometimes we cannot perceive, we cannot understand. And Lord, we need your word to speak to us. Lord, we need your word to be revealed to us today. And Father, we thank you that, Lord, as we seek to you, and Father, we're going to continue to go after you and chase after you, much like your word says, that surely goodness and mercy shall follow us after all the days of our life. Lord, I ask that your blessings be upon this room. That, Father, that your spirit rises up, your anointing rises to the top, and that every single flesh moment would be decreased and every single bit of your spiritual moment be increased. So, Lord, come move in this place today. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said. All right, so I need to tell you a story. The message that I had for you this morning, I am not allowed to give to you today. And that puts me in a very uncomfortable spot. Because I'm a person who loves to be prepared. I love to have all of my ducks in a row. But how many of you know most of the time when we try to get our ducks in a row, we find out how quacked up we really are? I thought that was funnier than y'all responded, but that's okay. When I woke up this morning, I got my cup of coffee and I sat there and I started reading my word this morning and something changed. There was a change. I think that I'll be giving my message that I was supposed to be giving to you today, probably next Sunday because I do believe it is a word for you. But I feel like this is what the Lord wanted me to share with you this morning. If you would, please turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I remember the first time that I ever preached on this particular scripture. I was at our church in Arlington, and we had this hippie couple that came up um, to the church. And as I recited the scripture, they told me, hey, how cool it was that I was quoting from a hippie song. And I had to tell them that I wasn't quoting from a hippie song. I was quoting from Scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, starting in verses 1. It says, There is a time for everything and a season for activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. Listen to me, right now is a time that we need to look at that particular scripture this morning. Now is a time for us to embrace. It's a time for us to refrain. Time to search and a time to give up. and It's time to uh, to keep uh, and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, and a time for war and a time for peace. Everybody knows how the election process went this week. We also know that it's not over with. We also know that there will be legal fights that will be going down. We know that there will be things that will change back and forth daily. But I'm going to speak to you from the Spirit 
Some of you will probably be ready to throw rocks at me, and that's okay. Make sure because it's I'm a false prophet, not because you got feelings hurt. I feel like we're in a different season now. America has changed. We're no longer the place that we was a week ago. We're no longer a place where we was six months ago. We're no longer a place where we was a year ago. But when seasons change, sometimes it takes us back, and sometimes we feel like we've had the wind knocked out of us when we don't get what we thought was going to happen. There's a scripture where God tells us that His ways are not our ways, and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And there's times I wonder, it's like, God, what happened? Did you mess up? Did you miss it? How many of you know God never messed up? God never missed it. As we've been preaching about end times and we've been preaching about things that were changing and coming about, I find that scriptures kept coming up to me this morning while I was drinking coffee. And there's been something that's happened in my life personally this week that has really been a rather quite surprise that I did not know was going to happen. In Daniel chapter 2, we read this here a while back when we did our study on end times. Daniel chapter 2, verses 21 through 22. Daniel says that God changes times and seasons and He sets up kings and He disposes of them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and lies in light dwells within Him. Church, I want to tell you that we don't know what will happen tomorrow. But we are called to be the church regardless of who's president. The church does not matter who the president is. And what I'm going to tell you is something that's really hard for a lot of us to understand because we like it when we're in the land of milk and honey. We like it when we're walking around with grapes the size of of softballs. We like it when everything comes easy. But unfortunately, our faith falls flat on its face when we're in the land of plenty. The church gets fat and gets lazy when it's not being persecuted or when the church is not going through hard times. The church that God so desires to be able to brag upon, to be able to put recognition on, and to be able to heap rewards to is this one church that He refers to that the gates of hell will not prevail against. And you know, when we are in the lap of luxury, the gates of hell prevails upon us quite often. If you don't believe it, look at Hollywood. If you don't look at it, if you don't believe it, look at our government. Look at what's allowed in our society today. Guys, I know I've heard some of you say you're tired of me talking about abortions. I'm so sorry, but this is what God has laid upon my heart. I cannot, I cannot say strong enough, hard enough, more often that it's murder. And when we allow murder from the, the seat of government within our country, our nation, we bear the price. You remember when Jesus and Barabbas was there, a lot of times they were yelling out for Barabbas, we'll take Barabbas, we'll take Barabbas, um, crucify Jesus, but we'll take Barabbas. And eventually the priest had to turn around and say, His his blood be on our hands. So when we allow the wrong to happen, guess what? The blood is on our hands. And as the church needs to rise up with authority, with power, with conviction, with holiness, you know, sometimes we need somebody to poke us before we get 
mad enough before we bite back. How many of you know sometimes we take a lot of poking when we shouldn't? Oh, come on now. How many of you like being poked? I like to poke my son all the time. I like to like mess with him while we're going down the road or at the house picking on him, messing with him. He don't like being poked. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like my spirituality being poked by a liberal way of life. I believe in church that we ought to live, preach, and teach as the Word of God says, not how somebody in a suit says we ought to. There is a time that we need to embrace and a time to refrain. I am not here to tell you that the election is over. I am not here to tell you that everything is done. I am not here to tell you any of that. But what I am here to tell you is when it is, when all has been said and done, somehow we have got to start working on unity back in our nation. Sometime in this process, we have got to figure out how to bridge the divide between cultures. Remember when we preached out of Matthew 24 when it said that nation against nation and we were able to go back and show that the word literally was not not as a nation but it was as an ethnos. It was an ethnic group. It meant that groups against groups. It meant ethnic groups against ethnic groups. How many of you know right now we're seeing that in our nation. We're seeing the ethnic groups going against each other. And it's sad. It is absolutely sad. I saw this week, y'all heard during prayer time, that my son, D-Ray, which is a black child, y'all know that, um, he came down with diabetes. And they put him in the hospital, in the military hospital in Germany. And his blood sugar levels were almost 1,000. So if you know anything about diabetes, and I'm, you're going to have to really work with me, but when you're a diabetic, they get really worried with you when you get over 600. They get really scared. So when he told us that he was over 1,000, or up close to 1,000, and me being a diabetic, not being his natural father, but being his father nonetheless, my heart was ripping. My heart was beating out of my chest because that's my son. And knowing what could happen, knowing what the doctors say could happen, how many of you know scare? Scare is not a word that we like to refer to in our hearts, but it does reside there. And yet, sometimes we have to pull on our big boy pants and we have to deal with it. And we have to call out to an almighty God to take control. Now his numbers are down in the 300s and 400s. They only kept him in the hospital about four hours or something like that and released him back to the barracks. And that, to be honest with you, that made me mad. Why? Because I want my son to get care. How many of you know that we need our nation to get care right now? We are at a a place where we cannot understand what is truly going on in the world. And the only only thing we know is these little reports that we're getting. And I'm going to be the first one to tell you, please quit listening to what's going on in the physical because there's something going on in the spiritual. Since we don't know what will happen tomorrow, we need to be the church today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7. I'm going to shorten the scripture up just a little bit. But Paul says that we live by faith and not by sight. Do you know I can't see what's coming tomorrow? I wish that I was a prophet 
to where I can tell you, but I'm not. I'm just a pastor. But when we live by faith and not by sight, it allows us to walk on till tomorrow, to tomorrow, today. Even though we can't see everything that's going to happen, we still need to be operating faith because when Jesus said that we are to go into all of the world, how many of you know it wasn't if it was ruled by our sight? Because if it was ruled by our sight, we would say that we're being locked down by COVID and the, and the gospel cannot go throughout the world. But how many of you know the gospel cannot be refrained and be stopped by some COVID-19 disease? The gospel of Jesus Christ will go throughout all of this world. And for those that are uncomfortable with Christianity, I'm going to be honest with you and listen to me, I am uncomfortable with Christianity. I am uncomfortable with Christianity as it is. I don't know if y'all saw this, but one of the, I think it's one of the Hillsong's uh, church's pastors, Carl Lentz, got fired from his church this week. Very large church. Carl Lentz is known throughout the religious world, and he had a moral failure. He failed his marriage. And he's a pastor of a multi-thousand member church, and he was fired. And he said that he was ministering from an empty place. And when he was ministering from an empty place, he lost who he was in Christ. Do you understand it doesn't matter if you go to a mega church or if you go to a small church? If you are in an empty place, then you will not have this faith to be able to walk out till tomorrow. You're just struggling trying to figure out where you're at today. And if you want to test your faith, if you want to test how well your faith is, put yourself into a room that is completely dark and turn off the lights and make your way across that living room floor. And pray that you don't have a child with Legos. <laughs> Somebody's been there before. Because to be honest with you, there's a reason why a lot of us don't change our living room furniture. Because we learn the pathways through our house and we don't even need to have the lights on. We know that at six steps, we turn left. Well, it's like a roping horse, right? Go out just a little bit and turn left. The worst thing that ever happens, you know how many emergency room visits happen because wives change furniture in the living room? Broken toes, legs, knees, nose, heads, and arms. Life is much like that dark room. Sometimes we have to walk by faith, even though we can't see what comes tomorrow. We have to walk by faith. And the reality is we don't have the choice not to walk. Jesus said to go, not to stay. This week, something happened to me. I have been looking for an extra horse for my family. I wanted to have an extra horse that we could ride. I've just retired Grasshopper. Uh, after 26 years of age, he is really at that point to where he needs to enjoy the next rest of his life in a pasture. He's been a good horse to me. He saved my life twice. He's never failed me. He's always been there for me. But it comes time to go to a new season where we have to bring in something new. And I have another horse, and he's a good horse. He's a safe horse. He's not a problem, but he doesn't have a lot of heart. And I'd made a comment to several people that I was looking for a horse, and this lady called me, and she said, uh, Hey, Stan, we've got a rescue horse coming in this week. If you want it, you can have it. It just needs to be brought back up. And she sent me a picture of the horse, and it was really a nice-looking horse. 
it was a little on the thin side, but how many of you know if you want something fattened, send it to a fat guy, right? So I don't know if you can see this horse, but by the time I went to go pick up the horse, could y'all kill these lights up here on the front, please? I don't know if y'all can see this or not, but when I went to go get the horse, this is what it looked like. Bones galore. Skin sagging. Muscles are gone. But yet it was a sweet horse. It was a gentle horse. And to be honest with you, I didn't intend to take on something like this. It wasn't that I woke up one morning and thought, man, let me just go do something stupid. Amen. But when the pictures got sent to me, could you show the next screen? This is what they said that it looked like. And so I had a choice when I went to go get the horse. I could have turned around and said, this was just too much. I don't want to have to tackle this. But as I showed my, that horse to my son when I got it back home, uh, me and my son shared a tear over that horse in the barn. Because we were saddened because somebody, go back please. Somebody did not have the means, the ability, or the knowledge, or the resources to be able to take care of that horse as it needed to be. They have videos of this horse, and it's been a great horse for children, for people. It's been used in ropings. It's been used in a lot of things. The only thing this horse needs is to be put back up on its feet, to fed, to be restored, to be returned back to its old self. He's 17 years old. And as I sat there and I looked at it, things started coming together. Here several weeks ago, well, a month or so ago, back in October, we had a trail ride here at the church. And as we were doing the trail ride, we had some prizes to give away. And Lone Star Feed had given us um, some certificates for a bag of what's called Infinity Horse Feed. All right, for most of you who don't know what Infinity Horse Feed is, this is what the bag looks like. It is their high-end bag of dog food, and so what, or not dog food, but horse feed. And so when you say the word high-end, what does that mean? The Hebrew word for it is cha-ching. So most of the, this probably won't mean a lot to, or a lot to some of you, but in this bag of feed is 14% protein with 8% fat. It has a high amount of alfalfa in it. It has calcium. It has all of these nutrients that an older horse needs or one that's been run down. But yet, because this horse has been starved out, I cannot go back in and feed it a regular amount of food or it will die. It is that far gone. And so I can only feed it just a little bit at the time. And you know, the sad thing about it is I read a story about how the Jews were near in the concentration camps. And when the American soldiers came in and relieved them, their heart was to go in there and just feed them and just give them all the food they wanted. But they couldn't because it would kill them because their bodies were not ready to receive. Their guts actually cut off and they are no longer programmed to be able to break down feed anymore like they used to. So you have to introduce them back in small amounts. And you have to teach the gut how to be the gut again. You have to teach the body how to take care of itself again. But you know what's the one thing that I love about rescue horses and rescue dogs? It seems like when they go through something, a lot of times they have heart. They have fight. They have something in them that's special. God knows Kay's dog is special. It came from a dog pound and it needed to be rescued and yet we rescued it. Oh, that dog is so special. It's touched. So those bags of dog or horse feed, they cost about 17, 18 bucks a bag where a normal bag would be about 850 give or take. Okay. But then I noticed 
that I won this gift certificate for one free bag of infinity. Do you know that God, remember I said earlier there was no such thing as coincidences? God gave me this certificate and I thought, well, maybe I'll just take it in. Maybe I'll exchange it in on my cheaper horse feed. Maybe I'll get two bags of horse feed for one. But yet, I don't know why I haven't used it. But all of a sudden, I found out I've got a horse that's got to have it for at least three weeks. It takes ten days for, to see if that horse will live. Matter of fact, the very first night that we headed at the house, we fed it. And we were worried about how much we were feeding it. And we took it out after we got through feeding it. And we took it out and the horse went down. And you could not let it be down on the ground. So me and Jonathan are trying to get this horse up. And we're trying to get him to move and trying to get him back up on his feet. And it had lost so much weight that I could just turn around and take my knee and press up against it and slide the horse in the pasture. We finally got the horse back up and got him walking around and got him moving. And as the Lord started speaking to me through this, this is where our nation is really at. We are sick and we don't even know it. We've had things going on in the side that most people just thought. When they started looking at that horse in that last picture where you saw it where it looked better, you know that we look back when we had better times, we think everything was so much better then. But you see, that horse is a horse of promise. That horse is going to be something that's going to change. I don't know how long that horse is going to be a part of our family, but I will tell you, while it's a part of our family, it's going to be treated like it's special. Any donations that y'all want to make toward its feed will be appreciated. It's a big old bag of offerings of feed up here. But what I want you to know is I want you to see something. I want you to catch this. Just like I hadn't intended on taking that horse the other day. And like I said, I don't know how long that horse will be with us. That's not the point. In the book of Esther, chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, the Hebrews are being persecuted. Mordecai has pushed an edict to the king. The king has passed it. And they have plans on killing out all of the Hebrews in the land of Persia. And starting in verses 12, there in Esther chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, it says, When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, uh, he sent back his message. Now listen, let me give you a little back thing. Originally before then, she was like, Well, I haven't seen the king in a while. You know, It's been 30 days. I probably don't have the opportunity how many of you know we all got excuses? Our excuses need to get kicked to the rear. And it says in verse 13, he sent back this answer, Do not think that because you are in the king's house and you alone of all the Jews will escape. For you will remain silent at this time. Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent the reply to the king, and to Mordecai, and says, Go to gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and, I'm, and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. I believe that the church, much like Esther, was called to rise above the chaos of the day and to be the church that it was called to be. I believe that the church, much like Esther, ought to realize that we are there for such a time as this. That if we don't say something, listen to me, God will move through another way if you don't. But the reality is, when you don't, then somebody else will have to. And then what will happen is you miss out on your blessing. You miss out on being a part of God's plan. And let me tell you something. Don't you dare think about being a part of God's plan for your own profitability. Because to be a part of God's plan is so that all of God's people will be blessed, 
not you and your parking your book your parking book your purse pocketbook you see because God wants you to be a blessing to those why because he's been a blessing to you to much has been given much is expected Darlene Estes probably the shortest person in this building work with me work with me I'm fixing to bless you Probably the shortest person in this building as an adult. I see you, Brad. But how many of you know it's not a matter of the stature that makes you strong? What's the old saying? I ain't, I ain't saying this to you. But it's not the size of the dog in the fight. The size of the fight in the dog. You see, I believe regardless of whether you're uh, big, whether you're small, whether you're short, whether you're fat, whether you're skinny, God knows I ain't seen that in a long time. But God wants to use all of you just the exact same way. And what you refuse to do, Darlene may have to. What Rodney refuses to do, George may have to. God's will will be done on this earth as it is in? How many of you want to be a part of God's will? But you see, being a part of God's will is hard. Why? Because it requires that you have to sacrifice. It requires that you have to make your Adam's apple move up and down. It means that you have to swallow the hard lump, and it means that you have to go forth and you have to say, God, I don't care what will happen to me. If the king will kill me, the king will kill me. But nonetheless, if I perish, I will perish. But by golly, he's going to hear what i got to say. Romans 5, verses 18. Let's start there. Romans 5.18 says, Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, for also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as though the, through disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so all through, also through the obedience of the one the many will be, can be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespasses may, uh, might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The church is called to be the church full of grace, not division. Right now, we have way too much division going on in the body of Christ over politics. And politics should not have anything to do with religion. Politics should not have absolutely anything to do with religion because politics has no authority or power over religion. Politics have absolutely no right to speak over God's Word. And then when it comes to a point where we have to choose to follow the law or follow God's Word, you are going to have a choice. You're either going to be an outlaw or you're going to be a follower after this law. But Jesus said the law came so that the trespasses would increase, so we would know what's wrong. How many of you know we know what's wrong? How many of you know if they say, Thou shalt not sleep with thy next door neighbor's wife, and you come to my house, you're going to get shot? That's well known, right? How I many of you know they don't take a Supreme Court judge to figure out what that interpretation is? But how many of you know that Jesus said where sin abounds, grace abounds even more? Church, I don't know how this stuff is going to go through the legal fights this next week. And I'm not here to prophesy that it's over and I'm not even here to prophesy anything that's going to change. Because I serve a God that's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. 
So when we start looking about who Jesus Christ is, listen to me, Jesus Christ is the same Christ today that he was on the cross. He was also the same Christ that was present when this earth was made. When the Spirit hovered over this earth and the breath of God entered into man, who do you think was the breath of God? But the Word of God. So what I'm asking you today is, when you get ready to leave here today, please don't be some religious nut. And please don't go around telling everybody that they're dying and going to hell because of their presidential candidate. But if you have to tell somebody they're dying and going to hell, tell them because they're a sinner, not because of who they voted for. Listen to me. We've talked about the candidates. We've talked about the platforms. We all know the evils of the parties. But do you know that there's not one single party that's any better than the other, really? Why? Because man is man, and in the hearts of man, guess what? There's evil. What I'm asking for you to do today is I'm asking you to do something so special. I'm asking you to walk around, and you know what? If you ain't got nothing good to say, just don't say nothing. Sometimes that's easier, right? And you know, sometimes we have to process through some things, right? I ain't happy about this election. I, to be honest with you, I want to spit on it. But yet my God is bigger than me. And yet I lived through eight years of Obama. I lived through four years of Jimmy Carter. So maybe I can pray that it'll only be four years for this one. But then again, if I do that, then I won't be doing God's will. Why? Because what does God will say? Pray for, you, for your leaders and not to be praying about. Why? Because when we pray, we're tattling. We're gossiping. We're rooming. You know what rooming is? It's like rumoring to God, telling Him what everybody else has told you. We need to be able to tell God, Lord, this is your man. You've placed him in office. What did Daniel say in chapter 2, verses 21? God puts the kings and leaders and rulers in authority. So let me ask you a question. Will you be able to turn around and say, God, I know that you got this man in here for a reason. And whatever your reason is, I'll accept it because your word is word. And I accept it today. don't mean you got to like it. Okay? It doesn't mean that. But it means that you've got to accept God's will in the midst of all this. And here's the thing is, I love what we talked about during worship, what was turned, what was meant for evil. We'll get turned for good. Ask Job. Amen? Guys, I'm finished. I thought it was going to be a lot faster than what I was. but I didn't know where the sermon was going to go. Matter of fact, I had no clue what the sermon was until I walked in and had my cup of coffee here at my desk. But my prayer is that this nation be restored, that we come back to being whole, that we have no more riots, we have no more problems, we have no more calamities. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm going to pray that when evil shines its face upon this nation, that the, the spirit of righteousness would rise up and smack it down. Why? Because we need storefronts to stay open. We need family businesses to be able to continue. We need to be able to have people to have safety and security. But I'm also going to tell you, you know, the church does well when it's being persecuted. Do you know that the strongest time that the Jewish church ever existed was when it was in Babylon? So do you hear what I got to say? It may be time for the church to rise up, to shine like it never has shined before. You don't have to retreat and you don't have to repent because of your faith. But better, you better stand upon it just in case. Amen? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Normally I ask a sinner's prayer and we ask for a dedication for anybody that might want to get saved. But I know most of y'all. I've seen most of y'all in this place before. And I know that there is no such thing as consequences that you're here for a reason today. My prayer today is that you will understand that there is a new beginning in your life. 
there is a new beginning in this state, in this nation. We still have some more elections that we need to be prayerful or over in Jan January, which will concern the House. We need to be able to stay above that. But I think that right now God has got everything in such a way that God is going to do something in the midst of this that you're going to look back and say, wow, I never saw that coming. And I'm going to ask that you just have a spirit that you'll receive that. Remember we asked you to lift up your hands earlier just to receive. Will you lift out your hands one more time as I bless you. Father, I bless these people today. Lord, I ask that you shine your face upon them. That Lord, that you would be gracious to them. That Lord, you would be good to them. That you would bless them throughout their generation and their children's generation and their grandchildren's generations. Father, I pray that, Father, they're blessed in their comings, blessed in their goings. They're blessed in their businesses, their families, their finances, their health, their herds, their crops. They're blessed in the highways. They're blessed in the byways. They're blessed in the cities. They're blessed in the countries. Lord, they are blessed. They are your people. So, Lord, only you know how this nation will go over this next week or two. And, Lord, we know there'll be chaos. But, Lord, we pray that, Father, that your spirit of peace would reside upon this nation. That, Lord, that you would reside upon each heart that's here today. Father, I pray a special prayer of protection upon each person here today, that COVID-19 would stay far away. That, Father, the fear of political worry would stay far away. Because, Lord, Your Word says You're the same yesterday and today and forevermore. Father, Your Word also says that, Father, that You would never leave us nor forsake us. So, Father, as I release these people to Your care, Lord, I know they have their concerns. They have their issues. They have their thoughts. But Lord, I ask that you would allow the Holy Spirit to speak to them. Father, break their heart for what breaks yours. Father, we ask that you would remove the scales from their eyes so they can see. And so that, Lord, they would realize there is more for them than against them. So, Lord, we love you. We praise you. And we glorify you. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, guys, we love y'all. Thank y'all for being here today. If you're going to the Deer Woods this, this week, be careful. And bring me back some backstrap. Love you. Bye.